Hello to everybody. I am so happy uh, to, to, uh, to get a chance to, to introduce uh, this incredible book. And greetings to everybody online coming on for an, an amazing evening. My name is um, Colin McCann, and uh, we're here to celebrate uh, one of the finest books uh, of the year and a book that's going to last and a book that's going to talk to history that's also going to talk to the streets a book that's also going to talk to our very hearts um, as we uh, negotiate through the whole process of learning to, to what, what we came through and how we're going to recover um, it's a love story uh, it's a war story it's a book about courage it's a book about fealty about crumer about about cruelty about witness uh, it's honest it calls one of the world's great writers, Jim Shepard, to, to, to call, call, call the writer a wise ass. <laughs> and in the very best possible sense, it's defiant and it offers all sorts of um, insight and it offers ultimately um, a glimpse of hope and a real glimpse at the nature uh, and nurture of, of love. So this is what... Uh, um, uh, this book, First Responder, is, and what we're going to get a chance to do tonight is to talk to um, the incomparable author, Jennifer Murphy. And I am delighted that one of her best friends and one of my colleagues from, 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 from Narrative 4, uh, the, um, a wonderful person, uh, and just uh, who I'm honored to be uh, sort of on stage here with, if you, if, if you will, uh, Felice Bell. And Felice and I are going to um, be peppering Jennifer uh, with a couple of questions. And then we're gonna allow uh, everyone online to come in and further pepper her and celebrate her. And uh, hopefully you've filled up your glasses or your cups of tea or whatever else it happens to be. Uh, and uh, I wanna raise our glasses to I got my Starbucks coffee to, to, to Jennifer Murphy on the, on the occasion of the launch of her fabulous new book. Jennifer, cheers. Thank you, cheers. Mom. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Felice. Um, and Felice, it's so nice to see you. Good to see you too, Colin. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm Felice Bell. For those who don't know, I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Narrative 4. I'm also Jennifer Murphy's best friend. Best friend. <laughs> best friend and sister and I could not be more ecstatic to be hosting or co-hosting her book party thank you all for coming I saw a few people raise their hands in the zoom because this is a webinar we can't bring you in but if you have a question please put it in the q a it's right next to the chat at the bottom of your screen so we're going to get started Jennifer Murphy Jen <laughs> congratulations thank you Thank you. Um, the book is beautiful. I laughed, I cried sometimes at the same time. I would like to know, when did you first fall in love with stories and what compelled you to tell this one? You know, sister, I should have prepared for the kinds of questions you asked. No, this is live. We're doing it live. Well, I, I know, I know. And I asked what the question would be. And you were like, no, I won't tell you. It's true. When did I fall in love with stories? I, I have wanted to be a writer and a storyteller since I was a very little girl. Um, I do not come from a family of artists. My family are, are working people. My mom had multiple jobs, one of which was working for a cattle auctioneer. Uh, my father managed a moving and storage company. So to grow up in Central California and have a dream to be a writer or a painter, I loved painting when I was young also had interest in being a florist. Um, all of these things, you know, to kind of take the art seriously and to select them as your vocation was not something that got done. Mm -hmm. So it actually took me, the love for story came very, very early. I remember writing poems when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, and I would read them and see if people would cry or if they would have a reaction. But it took me into adulthood until we met at the New Yorican mm -hmm. in my early 20s to start seeing that, oh, this could be a vocation. Like, mm -hmm. this could be something I organize my life around uh, story and storytelling. And 
what compelled me to write this one was really, you know, as you know, I was working on a novel and had finished it right before the pandemic and was shopping for agents. And then COVID started to land in New York City and on the ambulance, uh, what we were seeing because of the way the disaster played out was something that the public wasn't seeing. And I started to feel a new urgency to tell the stories from the street straight. Mm. You know, real people on the ambulance, in the precincts, in the firehouses, people who've gone to war, to hear the voices from the street felt to me um, as necessary as air. Mm. That's really interesting, and, 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 and it really does feel like um, the stuff is coming up from the streets. I mean, uh, you're out there, we're, we're on the ambulance, we're meeting people, uh, you know, we're consoling them, we're, 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 we're getting things thrown at us, there, there, there are insults being hur hurled in all sorts of directions, there's tension between the, 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 you know, the, the fire department and the NYPD and, and with you guys, and, and somehow through all of this, and, and, and it's plumes and plumes and plumes of smoke. You somehow um, make sense of it uh, from us because it does feel like it comes from an entirely honest place uh, from the street. Can you talk to us about the process of like finding the street uh, in your voice and then also um, about how quickly this sort of came about because um, it, the book arose quickly for you, I believe. It did, it did. So the... I think one of the, the highest compliments I've received so far from people who, who've read it, you know, of course, I gave it to my partners and people who are in the book early. As soon as I got it, I gave it to them. And, um, and many of them texted right away and said, I can hear you talking. I can hear your voice. And this really is a, a story told all in voice and also in my real voice, who I really am, the way I talk to people, the way I talk to Felice, the way I talk to people I love the most, no mask. You know, in a world where everyone is forced to wear a mask, I really felt strongly about dropping the mask and just letting everybody see plainly, in plain language, what was happening, including what was happening in my own life. And um, the timing, of course, it was a very messy book to write because I was on the ambulance um, one of my dear friends, Mike, who runs through the narrative, was sick. Um, people, my partners were losing family members. I was worried about my family. And so the emergency, it, the, the book is really an emergency itself. And I was trying with a lot of urgency to get it out before the people I love most died, before something happened to me, um, before the public forgot us. And so I think that um, was a storytelling form I'd never been familiar with. I mean, it came out almost like a sickness, like the story must come out, you know? That, uh, I, I mean, I, I, can, I can feel that, 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 that fever that's at, at the heart of it. Uh, and, um, you know, that's what make, makes it so like completely um, compelling as a read because we're getting these intimate glimpses of your life, but also we're seeing things happening uh, as we all experienced it. And, you know, this was a time when we were both it, we, we were both uh, meaningful and meaningless at the same time. Our lives seemed so meaningless, uh, and yet we were meaningful because we had to wear the masks and we're six feet apart from, 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 from one another. We knew that our lives had, had these things. And then along come you guys. And, um, and I, I just want to do uh, uh, quote one uh, thing before I hand it over to Felice. You, um, you quote James Baldwin at the start of the book, and James Baldwin says, heroes are rare. And then you have another quote from Constantine Joseph Juracek, I think is the pronunciation. And this is beautiful too. We, the unwilling, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have done so much for so long with so little, we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. And, 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 and so much of the book seems to speak to that. Uh, um, thanks for introducing that James Baldwin quote column, because I know, Jen, you have a lot of thoughts about the hero narrative, how we, who we call heroes, how we treat heroes in real life. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think one of my goals, um, one of my goals in this writing process and in this story was really to write against the reigning narrative, 
we have a lot of books coming from the street periodically from retired cops, uh, seasoned paramedics, often men, uh, fewer from the EMS world, but you'll get them, you know, paramedics and firefighters. And it's usually a kind of daring TV style. Here's the hero, here's the tough guy, here's the action drama, you know. And I think what people don't realize and what I came to realize quite painfully in COVID, um, and I know you know this because you dealt with me as a very messy friend, was that the hero narrative is very damaging mm -hmm. because it, it essentially is, is people are walking into a doomed situation many who have very little choice. I had a choice. That is not the common experience of most people who were on the ambulance or the people working at CVS or the gas stations or the grocery stores. They're in a doomed situation. And we think that the way to appreciate them is to post on social media um, you know, and to hashtag them and to clap for them. And what happens when you're in that position is that it doesn't impact any way that you move around the world. And disasters of the magnitude of 9-11 and COVID, they happen to the community. They happen to groups. There are no heroes. Mm -hmm. I'm never on an ambulance by myself. And, you know, so I really, I wanted to, to see, let's get off this hero narrative. Let's, what do the first responders feel? It's actually quite hilarious out there. It's quite emotional. It's it's intimate. It's gross. It's violent. It's sad. And and you will see EMTs and paramedics cry and you will see firefighters go to therapy and you're going to see soldiers, you know, have other problems. You're going to see an ER doctor have a spiritual experience and we never get to hear those stories, you know? So I felt very strongly that of, about writing against the hero narrative. You know, there is, a, a lot of people have texted me or called and said, there's no heroes in this book. And for me, there's one, you know, Mike is, Mike is a hero in the book. And, and truly the sick and dying and the family members were, were the amount of humor and grace and tenderness and courage that they showed in the face of disaster was remarkable and very humbling. You, you mentioned say, Mike twice, and so I think I would love to talk about who he is to you. I know the, bike, the book is dedicated to Mike and Pat and Ilva, and so if you'd say a little bit about that community and how they've been your first responders. Yeah, so um, Mike uh, is the brother. He is a, a firefighter turned ER doctor who was based in Las Vegas that started off as a New York City firefighter in following the footsteps of his brother, who was his Irish twin, really, Pat Brown, who was a firefighter who lost his life in 9-11. And I knew Pat from yoga and from sobriety. And he, Pat was one of those guys who knew everybody in New York City and touched everybody in New York City. He was, he's like you. I mean, I can't, <laughs> you, I, I can't take you anywhere or I'm walking down the street with you and people who from all walks of life come out of the sidewalk to shake your hand and tell you how they love you and know you. That was what Pat was like. And I really admired him and looked up to the way he lived his life when I was younger. And he helped me a lot when I was, scared and had cancer and, and he was a rock. Uh, I think for a lot of people, he was a pillar. And um, his brother, Mike, wa I got to know at the firehouse, Ilva introduced me to him. Ilva was Pat's last love, which I'm very happy to kind of share that narrative with the world because it's very known in the community, but not publicly. And, and um, Ilva and Mike and I, you know, formed a little instant New York family um, and and kind of were there for each other. And Mike played a big role when I was uh, on the ambulance. You know, one of the things we do as EMTs is we share stories. What happened? You're never going to believe what I saw. Can I talk to you? Something bad happened. It's the way that we move forward together. And Mike was critical, um, especially to have an ER doctor. Uh, who I could call and run things through and tell him what I was seeing. And, um, you know, he's, he's a hero. He was a hero to me, is a hero to me. 
That's beautiful. Um, you know, um, some people say that all stories are, are, are love stories, but inevitably within those love stories, there's going to be some sort of conflict. There's going to be um, some sort of tension. And the poet Jim Harrison says, uh, death takes away a lot of things, but never our stories. And one of the things that you do with, uh, with, with, with Pat is you put him sort of front and, and, and center and, and, and he uh, becomes alive again. And, um, you know, and, and, and all of this goes back um, very bravely on your part um, to 9-11, because not only do you take the mask off of um, uh, COVID uh, on the streets of New York, you also talk about the masks that weren't necessarily put on um, after 9-11. And you don't, you don't shrink back from, from how, you, how you feel about it. Can you talk to us about, you know, um, deciding that you were going to go and, and talk about 9-11 as well as, uh, as COVID, these sort of two giant pillars that, that, that in many ways came crashing down upon us all? Mm -hmm. I can. I mean, I thought my editor and publisher and agents and loved ones know this, but I've been trying to write about 9-11 for years. And in many ways, uh, you know, 9-11 was the unspeakable in New York and took so many lives so suddenly and violently that it, I also felt that it took my voice a bit, you know, that I was silenced and humb humbled into silence by 9-11. And, um, and I'd been trying to approach the subject for years, sometimes fictionally, short stories and journal, it just never worked. And it always was too large. It would always break the container. Mm -hmm. And in this book, I thought, well, now we're approaching, you know, I felt still very tied to 9-11 in that community. And, you know, that disaster is ongoing in terms of the impact, disastrous impact it's had on rescuers who cleaned up the city, including Mike. Um, and so that event is very alive for a lot of us in New York still. It's not a one day every 20 year event. And, and I carried that with me on the ambulance and it was crucial, I think, for me to be able to always speak back to 9-11 because 9-11 and the way that we treat surviving first responders of that event, that will teach us how we're gonna treat COVID survivors, right? That 9-11 still is giving us lessons and things to learn. And if you look at that community 20 years out, it is ravaged by grief and sorrow and trauma. And I felt very strongly that, you know, holding them both in balance was very uh, crucial for, the, for uh, the country to see, especially as we approach uh, the anniversary of the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 in a few months. But it made for a very long book. You talk about how we treat service people um, and how they survive the traumas that we sort of applaud them for being involved in. I know pay parity among EMS workers is something that you've talked about. Can you explain how their status differs on the street versus firefighters and policemen? Yeah, so, so EMTs and paramedics in New York City are um, not paid the same amount as fire suppression, the FDNY, or police. Sanitation workers, I believe, earn more. Their unions are quite strong. And so EMTs have been in the streets protesting for years to get pay parity shoulder to shoulder with fire and police. Like, we're, th we're out there too. We're on the same jobs. It's the same. Like, we're also getting killed in the line of duty. We're getting attacked by patients. We're dealing with infectious diseases and death. We're lifting and injuring our back. We're getting assaulted on the truck. And for, for you know, m many, many, many years, that cry has gone unheard. And I think part of the reason is narrative is because everyday people don't really understand what EMTs and paramedics do. It's a hermetically sealed world, uh, as is policing and fire suppression. It's, it's, um, it's a closed container. But if people don't see what we do and have no idea, then they, they don't really understand why pay parity is important, you know, and, and they'll say things like, well, you know, all of you have PTSD now, so you should go to trauma therapy. And it's like, yes, that would be convenient. But if, if there's no economic justice and people are worried about how to pay their rent or they have to work two jobs to, to basically stand shoulder to shoulder with other first responders while they're risking their lives, trauma therapy is a luxury. You know, it's, it becomes secondary. So 
So that's the um, the the kind of forever war of pay parity in New York City, and it's. Um, I think at, at some point it also became very important to me or exciting to me that the book would come out before our next mayor is elected because this is also a problem that comes from the city's leadership, right? They, they will say, we don't pay EMS work the same because EMS work is different, mm -hmm. meaning it's less dangerous and high risk than mm -hmm. policing and fire suppression. And, you know, 2020, if anything, has hopefully eradicated that argument. Um, but it needs to eradicate it to the point of economic justice for everyone on the street. So um, it is a hermetically um, sealed world and, 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 and you do show us how dangerous and, and, and high risk it is. But can I also say that the camaraderie there is kind of stunning. It's it's really beautiful. Uh, people need to know, uh, if you haven't gotten this book, you're going you, you, to be torn up a wee bit, but, but, but you're also going to laugh your hind end off because it's very funny, very touching, and, and and you guys are very close. And even with this tension, say between the different departments and the pay and everything like that, somehow, uh, I know you say there are no heroes, but it's, it was pretty heroic to me the way that uh, you operated with people uh, on the bus, uh, as they say, uh, and 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 um, the funny stories that you share with one another as much as anything, as much as anything else. Was it nice to recall that, even though you know, the, alongside the dark material? It was. I really. Um, one of the things I love. I mean, most people in my life who know me know that. I love to laugh and um, and it's salvational on the street, the humor. It's so dark. It's so, it, it's hilarious. And people are hilarious. Our patients are hilarious. The other first responders are hilarious. The things that go wrong on the, like we're always joking of, you know, okay, I'm at a shooting, just need a little oxygen, except I can't seem to get it out of the bag. So the public was gonna watch me wrestle with the oxygen tank for, you know, 10 minutes. It's a, it's a kind of comedy of errors. And as you mentioned, you know, uh, it's a very conservative world. Uh, and at the same time, the people out there doing the street, I mean, I love them. I would give my life to them. I, I feel they are truly, it's a family. It's a dysfunctional, insane, hilarious, selfless family. But, um, the, you know, the people at Park Slope Volunteer Ambulance Corps, which is an all-volunteer crew, I mean, nobody, everybody held that organization together and moved through the, the disaster. And they didn't, while working multiple jobs and experiencing COVID and losing family members, it is, it, it's, it's to be on the street with an organization like that is profoundly meaningful. You know, and, and I think it's something that, that the country lacks. It's really hard to find that. And when you're off the ambulance, it's really hard not to want to go back on the street. You know, even though you know the consequences and you get burned out and it's tiring and thankless and nobody gets it. And, but the laughter and your partners and the closeness and, and really it's a, um, it's a no bullshit zone in, in many instances, you know, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of non-emergencies. That's half the job. But in terms of frankness and real kind of like just one person to another helping, it's there's an honesty to it that I love. I love this idea that it's your memoir and your name is on the cover, but it's actually the story of so many people that you work with, so many people that you love. And so much is in this book. And there's also so much that's not in this book. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Only you know that. <laughs> I mean, writers make choices. They make choices. Um, so I'm curious how you decided what you wanted to include and, and how you wanted to not touch some things. Yeah, I'm, I got really sage advice from other friends, um, one of whom we, we share in common, Ellery Washington of Pratt who I love. Um, and Ellery, I remember talking to him and saying, I'm going to really open my heart. I'm going to open my life. Um, I'm scared. Um, 
I don't, I don't, the world is going to think they know me. They don't know me. They're going to read the book and think they're close to me. They're not my friend that nobody's going to bamboozle me. <laughs> and he said, you know, you're going to discover, you're going to craft this memoir. You're going to decide what you want to share, what you want to hold back. That's a dance that you're going to do. Your closest friends will know the full story. And this is not a, um, it's not a transcript of your life. It's a story. And you're going to, you know, carve it up and, and kind of bake it like you would a pie. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most difficult parts of writing it, and I think my agent, um, you know, and my editor had a really hard time with this too, is so many people had so many stories to share. Mm -hmm. And so I really tried to include them all. And, you know, one of the, the between drafts, one of my readers said, I, this is the most painful book to edit because all of these stories and voices are so important, but like try to focus, try to focus on you and your, your life. But I, my tendency is to really want to bring in all of the voices from the street and from my life, people like you, um, who are really, um, <laughs> We, are, through. we haven't cried. Let's just tell the people that you were like, what am I doing in a book about first responders? <laughs> Let's talk about that moment. <laughs> and, and the truth is that, you know, you are absolutely one of my life's rescuers. You're my emergency contact. You did hard labor for me during COVID. I flipped out on you and all of my civilian friends. At, well, at one point, I hated everyone. Uh, um, you know, this is it's hard to be in the life of somebody who's going through big trauma. And, um, you know, our friendship has been unflagging and, and that counts, mm -hmm. you know, that counts. I mean, you have literally saved my life again and again, <laughs> even before you were an EMT. So call on, let us cry. Call help us. I tell you what, <clears throat> that's amazing because I was about to put a call into my bookie. Like, when is she going to cry? Right? And, and I was like, okay, is it going to be before 7.30? Well, it's 7.29. Um, <laughs> I am delighted. Um, hey, guess what? I cried uh, reading this book. I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, it was one of those books that 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 sort of opened me up and 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 opened up my rib cage and and sort of gave me gave me a good lesson about uh, how to feel about uh, uh, about people. So I think it's perfectly fantastic that you guys go and go ahead and have a good cry. Um, I want to move on a little bit um, to what I found uh, to be uh, you know. Uh, well, well, it was natural, really. I mean, you're 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 a novelist, and 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 you've gone through the MFA programs and and all of this, but it's just it, for me, it was so well written, and 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 it was musical, and it had the rhythm of the street, and 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 what a book must do. Uh, Samuel Beckett says that, that 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 the job of art right now is to find a form that accommodates the mess, and in certain ways, uh, the form of this book and 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 the constant you know storytelling, it, it's like a siren um, sort of sort of going off and spinning and spinning and each of the the the, the stories adding up to the emergency uh, which is really you know the emergency of of the heart and I was hoping that maybe Felice and I had talked earlier that maybe we'd get you to read um, a little section of the book and, and and maybe one or two minutes to give people just a little flavor for some of the stuff that's going on and and, and that section about your your grandmother um if we, oh, can, yeah. if we can hop to it would be would be an amazing one uh, to go to as um yeah, because this is not only about, um, you know, your extended family on the streets. <clears throat> it's also about your family. family. Yeah, I love my family. As my mom told me when I was writing this book in Frightened, she said, you come from a long line of strong women. And which was so That's reassuring to me. Yeah. But yeah, I'll read a little section where you'll get to meet my grandmother, who was one of my favorite people uh, on earth, a real firecracker. Um, in June 2017, a private company with a base in Coney Island hired me. They paid EMT's minimum wage, which at the time was $13.50. Base was far from my house, a commute that took over an hour and a half one way. I knew from my observation tour that private transport jobs were Dolesville. 
Some first responders said riding with the privates, as these companies were called, was not really EMS, since the bulk of calls were transports and non-emergencies. Driving grandma, they called it. But I didn't have a lot of other choices as a newbie. Nevertheless, when I finally geared up, I knew my grandma would be proud. What happened? I knew my grandma would be proud. I loved my grandma. Fern Albert and Dugan was an ornery, stout, mouthy woman who made crazy quilts, demolished boxes of seized candy, red westerns, and adored going out to lunch, preferably for enchiladas. She taught me how to sew and make pie crust from scratch, and she drove her plum-colored Cadillac while sitting atop the fat yellow pages of a phone book so she could see over the steering wheel. My, mother, my grandmother's love for me was perfect and absolute. They say that's all it takes in a child's life for them to survive. One person who loves them unconditionally. My grandmother was that person. She also taught me to believe in ghosts one day in 2003. A few years before that, in August 2001, just before 9-11, I'd been laid off from my job writing for a dot-com in New York. I was more than fine with it because I planned to go back to school and get an MFA in fiction writing at Brooklyn College. The novelist Michael Cunningham was teaching there at the time, and one day he called and told me I'd been accepted into the creative writing program. I remember exactly where I was standing when he rang, in my apartment in Little Italy, with vined plants hanging above a bathtub in the kitchen. And I remember thinking, I'm on the phone with Michael Cunningham right now. Michael Cunningham called me. But then terrorism struck. The towers collapsed, Pat went missing, the economy crashed, I couldn't find work, I had no health insurance and cancer, I went into debt and eventually lost my apartment. One of my doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering felt sorry for me and got me into a research study for free. For years I couldn't find adequate work, not enough to cover my expenses. Then two years later, in 2003, I gave up on New York and took a year-long contract job as a writer for a dot com in California. I was bitter about my exodus from New York at the time, as I didn't want to leave the city and I hated dot-com life. But since the job was in California, it gave me an opportunity to spend time with my grandma for a year. Weekends, I drove to Bakersfield to visit her in the nursing home where she lived. My grandfather had died years before. He was a quiet, gentle man who worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad, played harmonica, and washed his hair with bar soap long after the advent of shampoo. They'd been married for 65 years, so I figured my grandma must have longed for him something awful. Do you miss him? I asked her one day in the nursing home. Not really, she said. I was stunned. You don't miss grandpa? No, she said, smiling. I don't have to miss him because he visits me every night. What do you do? I asked. Oh, he just sits on my bed and we talk. The way she said it, the confidence in her voice made me believe her. She was as sure of his nightly presence as she was of the crazy quilts she sewed. For her, he was alive. That's Fantastic. my grandma. She's so sweet. Beautiful. I, I, don't, I don't have to miss him because he visits me every night. And that, in, in many ways, is about the whole essence of stories and storytelling, because people will be able to go back to this book and, 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 and relive um, some of the moments that we don't necessarily want to relive, but relive them in, 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 in a new way. And that what, what I found best about the writing was uh, that it put me, Jen, I would say that it put me in the pulse of the moment. So I was actually there and experiencing this stuff. And, 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 and the trauma, yes, is an intellectual trauma, but we feel it. And, 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 and that goes to the heart of this deeply, deeply um, empathetic book. And hearing you read is just, um, I'm gonna get you to cry again one more time before we finish today, but hearing you read is, is just really, really, really fantastic. And I know all the writers out there when they read this book will say, wow, this is, and I can't wait for the new novels and the next novels and other books to come along. Felice. Yeah, so Colm and I could ask Jen questions for hours, but we have some questions for the audience, so I'm okay. going to start asking some of those. Janet would like to know, with all that you do, how on earth did you find the time to write a book? And Janet did not say this, but I'm going to add in a pandemic, because <laughs> it was bananas last year. Yeah, it was bananas last year. I think... Um, 
I don't know. I think if I had to do it again, I don't know how I could answer the question of how that got done. I, at times it got done at great expense to my mental health. Again, my agents and my editor uh, and publisher know that. Um, I think that the story was essential. And so, you know, if I had to lose sleep to do it or wake up early to do it or miss a day of work to do it and have, have you know, my coworkers cover me, I did it. I did anything it took to get the story down. And, um, and there was a kind of ease of it because it, it had to come out. And so in that moment, you know, you, you have this experience where you ask yourself, you know, what's the point of me being in the world? What am, what am I here for? And for me, I've, I've, one of my lifelong dreams is of course, to always write a book and to have my dream converge with Mm -hmm. about the street with the people I love most in the world in it, you know, now. Um, and, and there are people I love who've passed away who have books and it's, it's what Colm just spoke to. It's like the stories are how we survive. Mm -hmm. The stories are how we keep people alive. The stories are how we recover and they're difficult stories. You know, they're difficult stories to tell, and they're difficult stories to receive. They come at great cost to the bearer and to the listener, but they're crucial to who we are, I think, as, as a, a people. Mm-hmm. So there's another question here um, about, um, does being, uh, from Lisa, does being a first responder soothe your writing soul, which is interesting, or vice versa? Does being a writer soothe your first responder soul? And there's another question from Ned that sort of dovetails in with that about what were the best moments during the writing and what were the worst? Mm. I think that to answer Lisa's question, they feed each other for me. Um, I've always felt that, I mean, the, the, the ambulance and the street is a place of story. This is where, you know, the it's high drama. It's only drama. It's pure drama. This is why everybody is watching uh, dramas about the street on television. And so, so it does lend itself to, it wants to be told. The street wants to be told. And the kind of tragedy of the street is you just tell it to each other. And part of the reason for that is because you feel like if you tell it to people who aren't on the street, they'll look at you like you're a monster or they'll look at you like they don't want to hear it. It's too difficult. Uh, they don't They don't want to talk about sickness and death. And so you, it, it embeds you further into the world where the stories are, any EMT, any group of first responders who get together will immediately start talking about stories from the street. They just start coming up. And then to Ned's question, the, the high and low points of the writing, the high points were really uh, one of my favorite things to do was kind of um, get get my favorite scenes and stories and patients down on paper and the, and the places where I felt really kind of said something larger about the street because the street's episodic, which doesn't work well for a narrative. So you have to be building something longer. Um, but one of the funnest parts was opening the writer's door and having my partners come over, people who were in the book saying like, is this how you remember it? What happened? And they would say, no, do you remember that? And yes, this is hilarious. And oh, you were actually driving the ambulance at that, at that moment. I wasn't driving. And so it was a grand collaboration and writing is so lonely, you know, so lonely. And the street is it's never lonely on the street. It's that's a, it, the street is a great antidote to loneliness. And so that was a high point and a low point was, I think because I was um, producing the book in a pandemic while on the ambulance and running the business, um, people mistook my ability to get the stories down on paper for me doing well. And so I had many moments where I had to kind of tell people, okay, I can't answer your call. I'm not, I'm not doing well. Okay. The, okay. Can't take your text. Not, not doing great. Okay. Can't, I can't make that edit. It's too painful for me. Um, and that became excruciating at moments where I felt like I, I had to kind of keep telling people and it was very hard for people to understand until they read the book. And that, you know, at at some point, like nobody had read the book. So they were like, well, she's writing it. Like, what's the problem? Um, And so, 
you know, a big, a big theme that runs through the book is the civilian kind of war divide of all of a sudden, I just felt like I can't relate to people anymore and they're not giving me what I need and it's enraging and I didn't know how to negotiate that. And the most helpful people in those moments were actually soldiers. You know, my ex-boyfriend who's Marco in the books, my friend Paul, who was one of Pat's beloved friends, Bobby, um, who is a first responder in his own right, Ilva, who's basically a soldier at this point. She's been through so much, you know, the kind of the, the, the goddess of the disaster, my, my wife 1A hero. Next question we have is from Courtney. Um, you were writing about a moment that we're still in the midst of. So as it was unfolding, how did you know the book was done? Um, I think when the readers read the book, they'll know why I knew the book was done. <laughs> um, you know, there, there was a very clear ending for mm -hmm. me from the book. But actually, um, one of the... The way that it ended before it's it ended as written, um, I mean, it's an excellent question because it was a question that I think all of us asked from the proposal stage of the book to writing the book of like, how do you wrap up an ongoing disaster? But in the writing plot process, the organic ending came to the book and, and kind of presented itself undeniably. And then my editor, who's a genius, Jessica Case at Pegasus, made like very masterful moves to edit the end of that book so that it had a kind of bravado on the page while also main, maintaining the spirit of the book, which was to kind of blow the door open. Um, but what else was I going to tell you about the ending? Oh, the ending I had written before it ended it this way was a story that Bobby had shared with Paul and Ilva and I last 9-11 um, about the, his kind of claim to fame moment when he saved Pat's life one day when they were swimming in, in Fire Island. And um, it's to this day, one of my favorite stories. I hope that, you know, I, I have it written down, you know, verbatim from, from when Bobby shared it. It's a beautiful story. And, and like Colin mentioned at the start of the talk, this book is a kind of re resurrection for the people lost that, that I loved and admired and to kind of like keep them alive, to have them alive again, to hear their voices, to feel their fierceness and their rage and their humor and their pure heartedness and their soul was, was very important to me. And, and so, yeah, I think the ending was born naturally. It's really interesting, um, you know, coming at the tail end of Passover and, 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 and Easter weekend and, 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 and all of these things. Um, these very serious themes are, 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 are running through the book, including, you know, the idea of, of, of resurrection and, 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 and looking after one another and, and, and even looking at your neighbour and even in looking at one who's supposedly not your neighbour um, and, and how to deal with them. And we have a really interesting question from somebody who I think we all know, uh, the Reverend Michael Calderon, um, who says... Um, to you, I really applaud your courage, and, and I agree, the, the, this is a really courageous book. I really applaud your courage, personally and professionally. I anxiously wait to read the book. This is a story that is long overdue. As a police fire chaplain, I see many sides of the call, and I'm looking forward to this one. Um, how would you respond to, it's a comment as, as opposed to a, to, to a question. I mean, it's an honor to have... Um, to have him here. And I feel, I agree. I feel this is a long overdue book. And I, I, you know, I was sharing earlier with my partners who are hiding in my bedroom, waiting to spring out like from a box, like, because it's always the circus in the EMT life, but they're the ones responsible for this sign. Um, you know, you were talking to me earlier about how was your day. And I had mentioned that um, a paramedic friend came over from Queens and he just got destroyed out there in 2020 and has a diagnosis of PTSD. He performed, you know, 50 cardiac arrests at one point and lost the, lost the majority of his patients. Um, and and of, unlike me, who pulled myself off the ambulance when I started to kind of falter, he's been working nonstop and he said he was giving me a hug and he came over to pass out books and he said, you know, our, our, he said, I'm, I'm at the midpoint um, and, and it's hard, it's hard, but it's so important and people have to know. And he said, are, you know, are you going to talk about suicide in the book? 
And I said, yes, you know, we're going to talk about suicide. We're going to talk about alcoholism. We're going to talk about di disastrous domestic relationships. We're going to talk about all of the, th the things that are going on um, that never get addressed at great cost to the hero. You know, the hero never gets to ask for help because the hero is the okay person. And the truth of the matter is um, everybody on the truck is a, is a very, usually the best rescuers are quite sensitive. Mm. You know, some of the most talented rescuers on the street are the most sensitive people and we have to take care of them. And that means we have to tell the difficult stories and we have to go against the master narrative. We might have to get in trouble. Um, you know, we have to, we, we have to blow the door open so that people can truly see what's happening and help. That's a great segue into this next question from Rachel. She asks, how can civilians better support first responders? You make some really smart policy suggestions, but also what can we do on a more individual to individual level? Mm. Yeah, I, I was speaking about this earlier today, but I feel that, you know, one of the ways um, you can help first responders, they're basic ways, but one of the ways is educating yourself. So taking an EMT class, taking a basic first aid class, taking CPR, one of the things that often happens on the ambulance is that people call for non-emergencies. That's not just a New York City problem, that's a problem in every city and state. And the reason they're doing it, it happened of course during COVID, people were at home watching the governor's uh, news and flipping out, rightly so. Mm -hmm. They saw the numbers and, and they were trapped at home, there was nowhere to go, people were isolated. And so what happens is you start to panic and the worried well start um, you know, flaring up on 911. I think I have a fever. I have, I might have it, you know, what do you think? And in those moments, what you're thinking as a first responder is, ah, I wish this person had a basic knowledge mm -hmm. of just basic medicine. You know, how do I control bleeding? How do I do my, my oxygen? What's a normal oxygen sat saturation level? What are the symptoms of a serious emergency? How do I differentiate? When is it time to call 911? Because I think one of the tragedies of the street is we sometimes, you know, we, we kind of make fun of people who aren't in uniform thinking like, well, you know, we're the people who know what emergencies are and they're the people who don't know. But that, that, that blows right back in our faces because in fact, um, you know, People can learn how to do these things in a few hours. And if they can learn to do that, they can help not only themselves and first responders by kind of knowing when to call 911 and when they're safe, but they can also help their family members. You know, we really, I'm a big advocate of turning bystanders into rescuers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is their ca campaigns for that across the country, especially with mass shooting. We have Stop the Bleed uh, movement. But there's no reason uh, we should have so many guns in this country and people trained to use them, but they don't know how to apply a tourniquet or mm -hmm. they don't know how to restart a heart. And so in those moments, they have to, they're at the mercy of waiting for a first responder. And that means what if the ambulance gets stuck in traffic? You know, then, then your, your grandmother's life is in the hands of a traffic signal in Brooklyn. Um, or a crew of rescuers who maybe isn't that experienced on the street, that's who you're putting your loved one's life with. There's, there's just kind of no good reason for that, I think, at this point in our history. If we're awake, it's like time for everybody to grab a mannequin and start compression. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll all go out and, and we'll, 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 we'll grab our mannequins, so to speak. We should be the slogan for tonight, grab your mannequins. Um, can I just say, I want to say this, one of the, you're talking about the tragedies of the street and the tra one of the tragedies of the street is that we blame people. Uh, but what your book do, do, does is it becomes an indictment of the system, but it never becomes an indictment of the human heart. That's what was really, really quite extraordinary while I was reading it along. And, 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 and you have a lot of people there um, in your world. And with that said, I want to hand it over to the, 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 the chef of the evening, the maestro, Felice. Uh, to uh, to well, we have some special guests. Yes. So hi hiding in Jen's. <laughs> they're in your apartment, Jen. Oh, I like how your face is like. Oh my like, God, who's, who's here? It? Who's coming, ladies? So you might know them from the book as Nina and Lexi. <laughs> they are Jen's EMT partners. Ladies, 
<laughs> and, and, and while, while everyone is coming in there, can I just remind everybody to go to Books Are Magic, an amazing bookstore in Brooklyn, one of the best, and order your signed copies. And there are even free copies for uh, active uh, New York-based um, EMT people, which is just an incredible uh, gesture. But um, yeah, look after your local bookshop and, and so on. So here we have our... our here we have our my hero, my baby! <laughs> Ask them whatever you hey, want. Nina, the more Michael. difficult the question, the better they're ready. I would like to know one, what is it like to work on an ambulance with Jen? And oh! <laughs> two, what do you wish the general public knew about the work that you do? Um, working with Jennifer, we always call it clown town. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a situation going on, whether we're laughing, knocking into things, um, just enjoying each other's company and, you know, providing care. Thank you. I mean, Jennifer's great because everyone loves her. Yeah. It's Wait, not true. That's everyone so true. loves <laughs> Jennifer, which is great because when we're in difficult situations, we kind of tend to just, like, let Jennifer go. <laughs> <laughs> However, however, the joke, I think, of all of, everybody has their specialties, but, um, I mean, Christina can't go anywhere on scene. People love to scream at her. She just stands there, and somebody comes screaming at her. It doesn't no matter what she's doing. She's always getting screamed at, and she is also very popular on scene with other first responders, so I feel like between the three of us, it's, um, we work it out. <laughs> What was the second question? What do you, what do they want people to know about the work that we do? Yeah. Um, I think that EMS is a little different in the other, from the other categories of first response because everyone knows about policing, everyone knows about firefighting, everyone, whatever you may feel about them, you know it's dangerous work, you know what they're doing. Um, I think the thing about EMS, which Jennifer really talks about a lot in her book, is that it's Kind of a really hidden world from the public. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times the public just doesn't care about EMS, we're invisible. Um, but I mean at the same time they're still riding in the ambulances responding to every single emergency. They're, they get berated by patients, by doctors, um, nurses, by nurses. Um, they're getting attacked by patients. It's dangerous and all the while um, they're not getting paid what they deserve. They don't get the respect that they deserve and I think they're fighting for it kind of falls on deaf ears. Um, so I think that's why Jennifer's book is really special because it shows the public exactly why like these people, Jennifer's family, you know, deserve the proper treatment, which they've never gotten today yeah. in the city. That's awesome. Thank you. My <laughs> I mean, uh when 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 uh, you quote James Baldwin early on saying heroes are rare. Uh, it just strikes me that 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 that, that heroes are actually there, uh, you know. And for 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 those of us who sort of are outside the narrative, um, you know, looking at, at you three guys there in in, in that room, um, I hope it doesn't embarrass you to to say that that, that I do find uh, what 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 you do to be uh, so heroically uh, necessary and 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 sometimes uh, you know against the grain. So I salute I, I salute you for that. One of my favorite moments, and I don't know how you guys felt about it. Maybe you'll talk about it uh, in the summer. Was hanging out the window and banging the saucepans and 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 and, and say, you know, uh, hooting the, the the car horns for for the for the work that was being done. But how did you guys feel about that? The public banging the pots and pans. I was very touched by it. It was brief. It turned into different kinds of things being banged and thrown at us when the protest <laughs> erupted. So it was a bit jarring to go from that. But it, I think it was very, um, it was touching for me to hear it from the public kind of coming out. But there was this underlying feeling of, wow, for the first time we're truly seen. And at the same time, you know, put your pan down and let's elect another mayor that's going to pay EMTs and like protect us from a patient's assault. So what did you think? Honestly, it's something that I haven't seen before, especially since it was yeah. coming from Europe. So seeing everyone collaboratively, like just, you know, acknowledging us was nice, but I feel like it was very short lived. And I feel like we're going back into that stage that where we're being forgotten. Mm -hmm. 
That can't happen. That won't I happen. Mean, well, you, the you, book, you, if anything, is uh, no matter what the consequences are, the book is, if anything, a kind of like you can't you can't go back. You can't unread what you've read, right? You can't right. learn about this world and then forget about these people. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and that's the necessity of literature and that's the necessity of storytelling. And that's why this is such a profound and, and timely book because it says, okay, stop, let's look at this and, and, and let's figure this out because no, we cannot be forgotten uh, anymore. Right, Felice? Absolutely. I just want to read one line from the book that speaks to that. Um, you write, whenever I encounter the unspeakable, murder, suicide, cancer, 9-11, COVID-19, I need to hear the stories again and again. I needed to hear them from a thousand different storytellers. And so I love that you've given us this story filled with other people's stories that it will spark stories for more people. I have one last question because I know we're almost out of time. Okay, sister. But you're Irish. I and am you're... still Irish. <laughs> there no. I was. Oh, awesome. No, 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 no. Okay, by, by proxy. And you're familiar with the term a thin place. And I know the spirit world, right? Like you have a deep relationship with, right? This world and the world beyond. And so we've talked a lot about this world, but I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how your spiritual life plays into the work that you do or mm -hmm. who you're a writer. I think whether, you, no matter what your belief system is, when you're working with the sick and the dying, you're confronting death and your, your personal feelings about it. And, um, you know, my experience with um, losing people I love, particularly in 2020, um, is that the spirit lives on, that the kind of, we are not this body, we are not, you know, I'm not the book, mm -hmm. that, that we're, we're human beings, and once the breath goes, there's kind of something that is, um, that lasts. And that not only lasts, but that you can communicate with and keep alive. And if you want, if you're open to it through prayer or meditation or song or story. And for me, especially with um, the recently departed, <laughs> they're very, act I feel they're very actively in my life, you know, and, and I think a lot of people on the street feel uh they, there's a lot of weird like things that go the, un the unexplainable happens on the street there's the kind of and that's talked about openly like don't say it's a quiet night now we're gonna don't turn down that street that's where that thing happens or kasha i remember um she there's like the weird address in park slope where often calls come in but the the location can never be found and she's like oh that's just the ghost address but they're cool well we'll just not answer that emergency <laughs> where the ghost falls, I guess. <laughs> well, can I just say um, it's been such a such an honor to um, to to uh, engage with this this evening, and it's going to be around for a long time. This is part of history. Um, and history will get told in all sorts of all sorts of new ways. This is um, a history from the street, but also a history from the heart. And I I, I urge people once more to go buy copy, um, buy copies for summer, buy copies for Christmas, uh, buy copies <clears throat> for New Year's Eve, buy copies for uh, your mum and your dad and whoever else happens to be. Uh, buy them through your independent uh, local bookstore if you're in New York. Buy them through Books Are Magic. Um, no, Jen, um, it, it's amazing. I'm going to hand it to Felice to 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 um, to finish us out this evening. But thank you for the honor thank of getting a chance all. to talk to you on your pub date. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. I have no more words. I want you to celebrate and enjoy this day. Thank you for giving us the gift of this book. I can't wait to finish it. Thanks, sister. Thank you for for hosting this for me and leading. All right. Thank you guys for coming. Have a great night and Bye, get the Christmas responder. Bye.